Welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital part in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Hello, I'm your host, Rocco, and with me today, our special guest is Larry Bushy. Larry, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you, Rocco? I am doing excellent, man. We are going to sit down. We're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about Linux, and we're just going to have a good old discussion. Sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you have, you know, your list of things that you have done goes long. Uh, you have published books <laughs> on Ubuntu Mate. Uh, you've been a tech correspondent for other shows, for podcasts, but people will most undoubtedly know you for your own podcast called Going Linux uh, that you host with Bill Smith. Mm -hmm. That is what you're noted for. That is what people would recognize you for. But right. what would you say to somebody if they asked you, who is Larry Bushy personally? Well. I'd have to say that I'm just your average tech enthusiast who loves to help people um, build their confidence and competence uh, using technology in a way that works for them and not the other way around. Yep. Very nice. Well, I think that's a constant theme that we're going to touch on through this whole episode. Um, okay. <laughs> well, on your bio, uh, on your yep. LinkedIn profile, uh, you have a, a section of what you do. Uh, you lead a team of consultants for a cloud computing company. Um, what is it that you do specifically on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, mostly what I do in my professional life working for the software, con uh, you know, software company is I help customers of that company to optimize and extend their use of the software platform. And it's a cloud-based software um, that helps companies run their business on the internet. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right. What about outside of work, outside of Linux? Uh, do you have any hobbies? Let's see. Um, producing and co-hosting podcasts about <laughs> Linux, uh, writing an in-app help for Ubuntu Mate Linux, and let's see, writing books about Linux and open source <laughs> software. So no, I don't have any hobbies outside. <laughs> Seriously though, I really enjoy traveling by cruise ship and playing with my grandkids. And that's about it for hobbies. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm pretty, pretty busy as you could tell. One day I'm going to go on a cruise. I have never been on a cruise before. Oh, One day I'm going to yeah, get there. It, you know, the thing about cruising is you either love it or you hate it. And once you've been on one, you'll know which it is. And <laughs> so I, you know, people who ask me, because I've been in quite a few cruises, ask me um, about cruising. I, I say the same thing. I say, well, Try it out for a short duration cruise. Don't go on a one to two day cruise because they tend to be, you know, your classic booze cruise right. to nowhere sort of thing. So unless you're into that, it's not something that I would recommend. So go on a five or seven day cruise and then you'll know. It's, it's long enough to know what a cruise is about, but it's short enough to not have you trapped on a boat that you don't want to be on for too long a period of time. So your first one, take it easy, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it if you get to that point. <laughs> Do you have a favorite place uh, you took a cruise to? Uh, well, I, I can't say that I have a place I have taken a cruise to, but I'd like to take a cruise to Europe uh, and cruise around the Mediterranean. Haven't done that. Like to go to Alaska. Haven't done that. I've been to the Caribbean a lot and uh, to Hawaii. So, uh, and um, through the Panama Canal, I've done that one. So, I've been to quite a few places. Um, it's this is going to seem fun, strange to say for the the favorite place I have to go. 
uh, for vacation is home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like being home, but, right. uh, yeah, I, I don't really have a favorite place to cruise to. I, I just love being on a cruise ship. It's a great way to relax and vacation. Yep. Very nice. Well, uh, you work in a tech related field. Um, yep. so I would assume that you can freely talk about Linux in those places. Yeah. Uh, what about other parts of your life? You know, family, friends, people you meet, um, do you talk about Linux there? Are they receptive at all to it? Well, uh, my wife was using Ubuntu Mate for years and, and Linux Mint for years until I bought her a MacBook Air. Uh, and uh, the reason I bought her the MacBook Air, she wanted it to be more compatible with the rest of her Apple products. And, you know, that's fine. She had no problem using Linux. Uh, it worked just fine for her. Uh, she just wanted a little more integration. And let's face right. it, uh, you know, uh, Linux isn't at the point quite yet where we have everything completely integrated. And Apple's got it over Linux and Windows there in that they have full control over the hardware and the software so they can do that kind of thing better than anywhere else. And as far as anywhere else is concerned, I really, as a rule, don't promote Linux. Uh, but if somebody asks me about it, I'm going to you know, show them why my computer screen looks different from their Windows desktop. And if we get into the conversation about it uh, or about one of my books or something, I'll talk about open source. But I'm not going to try to force somebody to convert to Linux. You know, yeah. you know I'm not the religious Linux type that uh, is um, that that kind of forcefulness, but um, yeah, but I'll explain to people that there are other options to run their computer other than Windows and so and and Mac, uh, and you know if if they're interested, we'll go in deeper. If they're not, we'll I'll drop it. You know, and yep. that's kind of the way I take it. Well, I th I don't think it works any other way. Uh, you no, can try to jam so. it down through somebody's throat, but uh, it just never seems to work that way. So right. Well, I'm not I'm not that kind of person in the first place. But you're right. Yeah. If you do try to, it's the same as anything. You know, if you yep. try to force something down somebody's throat, they're going to push back, and that's not what you're looking for. Right. All right. So let's start at the beginning of your computer career. Okay. So what in the was, in the wayback machine? <laughs> yes, let's go back in the wayback machine. And what was the first computer you remember using? Oh, very clearly, um, it was a University of Guelph uh, computer science department mainframe, and it was running Fortran four with Watt five. And uh, the input was a Telex Teletype keyboard that created punch cards. And there was a card reader, and it had a printer, and the outputs came in a green bar report. And uh, yeah, that was the first computer I ever used is in, in university. And wow. uh, yeah, so it's been a little while. <laughs> Going way back. <laughs> uh, way back in the way back machine. Well, <laughs> let, let's face it. Universe, some universities aren't known for having the most latest uh, and greatest hardware, and this was the case. But it was a... Um, a pretty up-to-date computer course that I was taking. So the hardware we were using was not, like I said, not the latest and greatest, but it was uh, fairly mainstream at the time. And uh, But to answer your question a little more along the lines of what I think you were asking me, the first computer that I actually owned was a Tandy Co Color Computer 2. Coco 2 computer. Right. That was my first, my first personally owned computer, although I had used some before that. Well, you mentioned uh, university and stuff. W yeah. What, were you always into technology or what made you start to take a computer course? Yeah, I've always been, you know, in, in high school, I was good at math and everybody thought I was going to go into the computer uh, courses in university. And I thought, you know, I could do that. I know how to do that. I'll do that really well. Let me just go into biology or something. So that's what I did. <laughs> and then I figured out that there wasn't a lot of money doing, you know, chemistry and biology and stuff unless I wanted to be a teacher. And there was still not a lot of money in that. So um, I got back into technology at that point and uh, got into sales and selling technology and not so much using technology at that point but more into selling it. So 
you know, after learning the computer and programming basics at university, um, my sales career led me into using some of those programming skills uh, for doing demonstrations of the technology for customers. Um, and, you know, some of the applications that I was involved with were things like uh, data logging and healthcare diagnostic testing and control software for manufacturing. And, you know, these are systems that ran operating systems like CPM and DOS. And, and um, I was using basic programming at that point. Uh, and I never really had my own computer or even a company provided laptop at that time because, well, first there weren't laptops and secondly, <laughs> um, you know, compu computers were very, very expensive. So, you know, uh, com companies weren't going to provide salespeople with that. But that first computer I owned was, a, like I said, a color computer that I, I bought to learn more about home computing at the time. And, you know, Bank of America was just getting into home banking at that point. And so I decided, let, let me test this thing out, get, get a computer that I can use for this. And um, at that point, I was doing demos on, uh, for, for my sales career on computers like a compact, luggable computer. You know, this was, yeah, I don't know if you've seen those, but they were no. a suitcase size computer with a, it was a portable computer because it had a handle on the top but this thing was 60 pounds <laughs> and it had a seven inch green screen and the one i had was the the later model so it had two floppy disk drives oh my yes so the <laughs> <laughs> yeah and these were five and a quarter not eight inch so you know it was pretty modern computer at the time right. and so uh, you know uh i at that point in my career i was um helping a couple of the employers as I changed employers throughout my career uh, adopt uh, the very first technology for its sales organization. Salesforce automation is the category of computing that it was at that point in time, now known as, you know, customer relationship management, but it was SFA back then. Uh, so that, uh, advocating that for the, com the companies I worked for kind of got me into uh, managing salespeople and <clears throat> training people on software and managing um, the deployment of the company I was with at the time, their first set of laptops to over 100 field sales reps. Uh, and then from there, well, I have to say that at that time, it was like Windows 95-ish. So we were talking about IBM ThinkPad. I think my first ThinkPad was a 760C. And working, I worked for that company for quite a while, and um, I helped them to standardize on the ThinkPad as the computer for their sales and service organizations, and used multiple models of ThinkPads throughout the years, culminating before I left that company to go to the company that I'm with now in the technology field as a as a technology architect. But I guess I was on Windows Seven at that time, so that kind of gives you a span. Of computer, yep. so I've always been in. Long story short, <laughs> I've always been involved in in computing or technology, one way or another. And you know, um, after getting out of the sales part of my career, I started into uh, a more IT related kind of career. I was still in sales operations, I guess, but I was on a team to help deploy an ERP system. Uh, the sales part of the ERP system throughout the company worldwide. And then I got into the customer relationship management software, replacing that with the, the, a more modern version, a cloud-based version of that. And the company finally moved me from the sales role into a true IT role, uh, still using computers, uh, still using ThinkPads, of course, uh, at the time, and still using Windows. But then I found that working within a corporate IT environment was too restrictive. Uh, I did not like working in an IT department as an employee right. of, a, of a company because I felt that my creativity was being stifled. Um, so I moved to my current employer as a software consultant, helping customers to optimize the use of their technology. And they provide me with my first Mac computer. 
So really? I have a MacBook Air that I use right now for work. And that was the first time I started using Mac OS. And outside of work, I use various models of computer from Lenovo's to HP's. And I've had System76 and I've had Dell computers. My current personal computer is a Dell XPS 13. I have one, I actually have two, one running Windows 10. There's a story behind that as well. And another one running Ubuntu Mate, <laughs> which is my daily day, daily driver computer and the one that I record all the podcasts and everything else on. So that was a very long answer to a short question, but hopefully that gives you an idea of oh, no, that what was kind perfect. of computers I That have. was perfect. <laughs> yeah. So... Okay, so you mentioned all of that stuff that you did, but when in that area did you hear about Linux first? Yeah, so um, let's see. About 2005 is when I started looking at ways to customize Windows computers. Um, and during that time, I was... I you know, had learned enough about programming and that sort of thing that I could do DOS batch programming. Uh, but that didn't help me much in personalizing the Windows computer to make it work the way I wanted to work. But during the research of some of the DOS batch programming that I was doing, I learned about a program called Sigwin, C-Y-G-W-I-N, if I remember correctly. And that was a way to put a Unix-like operating system within Windows. And I kind of latched onto that, and that led me to Linux. Um, and that's that was the first time I had heard about Linux, uh, through Sigwin, kind of sideways, finding out about Sigwin, and then finding about Unix, and finding out about Linux. Right. So... What is intriguing you to try Linux? Is it that trying to find the customization ability? Yeah, exactly. I want. I was. I I always knew that computers could do more than a Windows computer would let me do. Right. And I could find ways to force it to do what I wanted it to do uh, <laughs> through customization or through writing my own programs and that sort of thing. But it always felt forced. And so when, when I discovered Linux and discovered open source software in general and found out that you could make it do things, uh, it would allow you to make it do things. And it was designed to allow you to make the operating system do things to make your life easier, I, I immediately latched onto it and, and never looked back after that. So what is the first distro that you end up trying in Linux? Let's see, the very first one, well, first of all, I looked at start trying to use Mandrake. Um, so I bought a, a, a book on Mandrake and by the time I finished reading the book on Mandrake, I discovered that Mandrake had been discontinued. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They stopped development on it, right? Yep. So I thought, okay, now what am I going to do? So I did a little more searching around for Linux distributions, and I discovered OpenSUSE uh, after looking at Nopix. You remember Nopix yep. was the one of the very first um, live CD-based um, Linux operating systems, right? It was one of the pioneers in that area. And I didn't really have a CD-ROM drive at the time uh, for my ThinkPad that I had, and I found a way to install it using floppy disks. Uh, not Nopix, but OpenSUSE. Because mm -hmm. I tried out Nopix on computers at work that did have CD-ROM drives, and I liked it a lot. Uh, so I was looking for a a distribution of Linux that I could actually install from floppy disks that wasn't going to take a steep learning curve. And I stumbled across OpenSUSE and found out that I only needed nine floppy disks to uh, install uh, OpenSUSE. <laughs> so that's what I did. I installed <laughs> my that. That was a plus home. back then. <laughs> that was a plus. In fact, if I remember correctly, if you wanted to install Windows using floppy disks, which I was doing for work, uh, I think it was something like six Windows disks. But then if you wanted off, it was Office, it was something like 
15 floppy disks to install Office. <laughs> yep. And uh, so I was relieved when I found out it was only nine uh, <laughs> to install Linux <laughs> and you got all the software that came with it. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, so I guess the first one I actually used was Nopix, the first one, and that was more of a trial sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I wasn't going to be able to use it on, a, on an ongoing basis because it was built to run off a CD and I couldn't really install it. So my first one I actually used as an installed a Linux distribution was OpenSUSE. So you try OpenSUSE yep. and you, you have this new thing that you're trying out. What are what are the good things? What are the bad things that you see when you install OpenSUSE and you get to the desktop? Hmm. Okay, so the good things are I can have the, the computer system do whatever I want it to do. It's, it's really refreshing to be able to change the way the desktop looks, change where the where the panels are. You know, uh, I can have... Um, I can customize the panels. I don't need to worry too much, too much about drivers. Although I had one computer that was giving me fits and starts with a uh, Wi-Fi driver at one point. So yeah, I learned a lot about uh, Wi-Fi drivers uh, through that experience, as we do. Them old horror stories always start with Wi-Fi drivers. <laughs> Wi-Fi drivers, yes. <laughs> Wi-Fi drivers are printer drivers, and then they're the printers that you can never get working on Linux, those kinds of things. So, yeah. So the pros were I learned a lot that new users no longer have to worry about, quite frankly, when using uh, Linux. A lot of the details uh, about using the command line and fixing problems using the command line. And the cons... Other than the fact that I had to learn a lot about using the command line to fix problems, there were really no cons to it. Um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun for me because I I enjoy technology, so I'd say it was all all pros and very few cons. All right. So, do you stick with OpenSUSE on that machine, or do you say, "Hey, I'm going to go back to Windows for a while"? Or yeah, I um, I stuck with OpenSUSE for quite a while, and then. Along came Ubuntu, and I discovered, I, I was looking around at different Linux distributions because I had started the podcast by that time, and I was looking at different Linux distributions to get, just to get a little experience with them so that I wasn't just stuck on OpenSUSE, uh, because I wanted to answer some questions that other people had, and so I looked at Ubuntu. I, I uh, burned a, a, a CD-ROM drive. By that time, I had computers with CD-ROM drives. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I I burned a CD-ROM and tried it out, and I thought, hmm, this is pretty interesting. Uh, oh, and they have something called. Well, I was using KDE on um, as my desktop on on uh, OpenSUSE, so I tried Kubuntu for the first time, and the first version I tried was 6.06. .06. And as soon as I tried it, I knew that was the operating system I was going to move to because it had everything that I was looking for. It had the, the power and the flexibility of Linux. You could do as much complexity as you wanted. If you were a software developer, you could use it for that. If you just wanted to use it for browsing the internet, you could use it for that. You know, um, and... The thing that drew me to it as the producer of a podcast for people moving to Linux for the first time was the fact that it was easy to use and they had put a lot of effort into making it for the average user. Uh, and I knew it was going to, you know, take over uh, a big position in the Linux ecosystem for, for Linux users and computer users in general, uh, especially those moving from Windows. So. That's that's kind of um, wh where I went to right. <laughs> is Kubuntu six oh six and and knew from there that's that's where I wanted to be and as as I as as Ubuntu um, developed over the years and as my familiarity with Linux grew and my personal taste changed. I moved into more of a GNOME-based distribution. It's still Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it was uh, GNOME 2. Uh, and I really liked that interface even better than the KDE interface. Although KDE gave you a lot more flexibility as to, you know, a lot more control right out of the box as to how it looked and what you could tweak. For me, it was fine because I love tinkering with stuff. But uh, for the average computer user, which is the audience for the podcast, it was no longer something that I could recommend when I found out how simple GNOME 2 was for the average user just adopting Linux and how you could make that look like uh, more like a Mac or you could make it look more like uh, Windows and make a user comfortable and yet not overwhelm them with so many choices that they would become lost, right? Yep. In, in the in the vast multitude of things that you could tweak, it's very easy to to just dive in and get lost in it and never come out. Uh, so you're right. <laughs> so um, GNOME had that kind of it, it was the balance between power and uh, safe and sane defaults, right? And um, so I I loved GNOME too, and then. When I found Linux Mint, I found that the uh, Cinnamon desktop gave me very similar sorts of things than GNOME 2. Uh, and, but they started to develop some things that kind of took it to the next level, right? And then Ubuntu went to Unity. And I didn't like Unity. <laughs> so I went to Mint, Linux Mint and started using Cinnamon. And the first thing I did with Cinnamon was I took the panel at the bottom and I put two panels, one at the top and one at the bottom, and it looked just like GNOME 2. <laughs> Strangely enough. Uh, but then full circle later on, I ended up back on Ubuntu. Uh, and this time Ubuntu Mate, which came with a desktop that did have a panel at the top and at the bottom, and it looked just like GNOME 2. And I guess what I was looking for was a Linux distribution that had what I wanted as its own personal defaults, right? Yeah. And I liked the way GNOME 2 felt and looked and worked. And I haven't tweaked too much from that uh, today. I still use Ubuntu Mate, except I use one of the uh, layouts that has a Mac-like dock not at the bottom, but on the right hand side. On the Just right hand side. Because it's different. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, because usually it's on the left. I know. Well, I like the window controls on the left. So the X to close the window is on the left, and the dock is on the right. And I use a program called Barrier that allows me to put my work Mac desktop to the right of my screen. And I have the Mac dock on the left and the Linux dock on the right. So they're both there sitting there in the middle, right? So uh -huh. it's easy to, you, re, whichever desktop I'm in, Barrier allows me to use a single mouse and keyboard and, and move fluidly between the Linux desktop and the Mac desktop. So when I'm working from my desk here at home, yeah, I, you know, I'm a, if I'm on the Linux desktop on the left, uh, my mouse moves to the right and there's the dock. If I'm on the Mac, desktop, I move it to the left, and there's the dock. They're both there side by side. And that's my workflow. Nice. That is actually a pretty good workflow. Um, yeah. I never heard of Barrier before, though. Um, yeah. Have, have you out. heard of a program called Synergy? I have heard of it, but I never used it. Okay. So Synergy, there was a precursor before Synergy. I forget the name of it, but I used Synergy for years. And the developer of Synergy took it from open source to proprietary with some still elements of open source to it. And it was free, still free to use for personal use. But if you wanted to use it for business, you had to pay a whole bunch of money. Uh, but at that point, Synergy got forked to Barrier. So there's still Synergy and there's still Barrier. And I switched over to Barrier because it's open source. And it uh, the, the folks working on Synergy tried to do a new version that didn't quite work all that well. And they reverted back to the old version. And I thought, they're going in a different direction than where I want to go. Let me just go to Barrier. And it works just fine. So 
Both those programs are available. They're both, I think, in the Ubuntu repositories, certainly Barry areas. And I haven't looked back um, since switching over to Barrier. But its claim to fame, and I've mentioned it on my podcast a few times, is that you can use a single keyboard and a single mouse con- uh, on a server machine. You set up one ser- machine as a server, and you can have up to, I think it's 16 computers. Uh, you know, with with it's like virtual desktops, except it's virtual computing, right? <laughs> across different operating systems, and it works across Windows, Mac, and Linux. Doesn't work nice. on Chrome yet, but someday, <laughs> someday, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chrome operating system. Well, you have tried a ton of different distros out in your Linux career, um, mm-hmm. but I believe uh, Bill is the distro hopper. On the yes. podcast. Extraordinaire. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I talk to him, he's trying something new. Have you gotten to the point where you are, you just want a, a working system when you sit down to work? Um, because a lot of people, when they first get to Linux, they start to distro hop because they're trying out new things. It's all exciting. It's all new. Um, yep. And I was too. I had distro hopped a course. Yeah. billion times. But right now I'm to the point where I have a machine and I have to sit down and do work on it and I need it. So is that the same for you? It is. And especially since, you know, um, I've, I've gotten busier at work and uh, the podcast has kind of expanded and I'm doing some other things. I just want a machine to work. I have for years now. And so I have settled on Ubuntu Mate as the um, operating system and desktop environment of choice for me. It works just fine, and I'm go- planning on sticking with it until something better comes along. And it would have to be something with some significant advances uh, to make me switch from it at this point. And I like Ubuntu Mate because it does what I want it to do. It looks the way I want it to to look, it has enough power that I can do what uh, it can do what I want it to to do, whether that's something as simple as checking email or something as complex as writing some bash scripts to to uh, automate some of my workflow. And uh, uh, it's it's the one I have based a lot of my work, certainly the the suggestions that I have for people, on the podcast are all based on Ubuntu Mate. Um, And it is my first recommended distribution for other users. Linux Mint, I think, is my second. You have to bear in mind that the podcast audience for me is not the sophisticated longtime Linux user. It's the new user to Linux. It's the person who may have just switched from, from Windows or just switched from Mac for whatever the reason. Uh, or they're interested in switching, and they're interested in what what are the problems I'm going to come across, or you know some some of the questions that we get from folks from the podcast are the same um, from you know month to month, but mostly I find there some twist that I hadn't thought of, or there's a new question that I where did that come from? Uh, those kinds of things. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep my recommendations to something that would be suitable for a new listener, a uh, new user to uh, Linux. And I like um, being on a system that I can recommend to other people. And what better way to be able to recommend something to you use it yourself? That's kind of my philosophy. Yep. Well, speaking of Ubuntu Mate, um, mm-hmm. you have quite a few books and manuals, documentation on Amazon that you have produced. Yep. Uh, what made you want to start writing tutorials on, like, actual books? Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. A couple of different answers to that question. I could take in a couple of different directions. So let me start with why I started doing this in the first place, right? Um, In 2015, Martin Wimpress, who I know you've had on Linux Spotlight before, and Mm -hmm. he's the um, originator of Ubuntu Mate, he reached out to me and and he had um, sent me an email and he wrote, I'm going to quote what he said here. He said, I've been trying to break down what Linux 
and Ubuntu Mate are for people new to Ubuntu Mate. Would you be interested in helping improve the content in Ubuntu Mate to better communicate this? So Martin reached out and I wrote him back and said, absolutely. What do you need? (laughs) So (laughs) what other uh, response is there? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, how can I help? Um, So that led me to writing the content for the about page on the Ubuntu Mate website. Uh, and on the, when you click on what is Ubuntu Mate, pay, uh, Ubuntu Mate about that page, I wrote a good deal of the content. It's morphed over time. So some of it is unrecognizable, <laughs> but the thing is I got it started and it's basically, it's still the same stuff. And in researching that, I went through what existed for help within Ubuntu Mate. And I found that when you pressed F1, you know, the help button for yep. anything in Ubuntu Mate. It would bring up help screen, but the help screen was always something about Mate. It was the, you know, it was the web browser help, or it was the file manager help, or it was the text editor help, those kinds of things. And I realized there's really no help for Ubuntu Mate as an operating system. So having written the about page and the what is Ubuntu Mate page, that kind of inspired me along with not finding any help when I reached out for help. Um, That inspired me to take the content that I've been working on for years on my website and what I had learned about Ubuntu Mate and knew about uh, Ubuntu Mate and mix in some old podcast episodes. And I wrote the help system for Ubuntu Mate that you find today, you still can't yet get to it with the F1 key, <laughs> but it's in the menus as the Ubuntu Mate guide. When you are running Ubuntu Mate, you click on menu and Ubuntu Mate guide is there. And that's what that is. And then having done that, um, I realized that uh, two things. First, that there um the, the help wasn't there for Ubuntu Mate. And although Ubuntu, uh, although Linux Mint had a user guide, there was no real good publication for a user guide, now some sort of technical manual, if you will, for Ubuntu Mate. So I f- wrote the first outline for an Ubuntu Mate guide that eventually turned into two different books. One for users switching from Windows or Mac to Linux, and the other one for a little more in-depth that uh, provides people who have adopted Ubuntu Mate a little more detail on not just the operating system and how to personalize it for your own use, but walks through some of the main applications in the in the operating system as it comes out of the box as opposed to the things that you can add yourself just the default applications what they do how they're intended to work and give people a little orientation as to what comes with ubuntu mate so those are the two books uh, that i've written and there have been different editions of them i started them back in 2017 and i have the switcher's guide, I like to call it, um, for to, for uh, Ubuntu Mate 20.04, already released on Amazon. And the more in-depth guide, I'm holding back until, uh, I guess we're in feature release now for Ubuntu Mate, but as soon as we get into April, I'll make that one available on Amazon as well, the third edition of that book. Uh, that's been updated for 20.04. But I want to wait and make sure that I have as many of the features in there as I can before actually releasing that book. So if you go on Amazon, uh, you'll find that it's um, it's the second edition that's available. The third edition will be out sometime towards the middle of April, I suspect, just before the end of the month release of Ubuntu Mate 20.04. So those are the books. And that's how they got started and you know, how I got ended up doing them. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome though, man. That is uh, one way to contribute to uh, Linux. Exactly my thought. (laughs) That is awesome. I love it. 
Well, you have one, uh, it's using Ubuntu Mate and its applications. Yep. Um, you, you also have one uh, Ubuntu Mate upgrading from Windows or Mac OS. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the idea of having an actual hard copy yeah. in somebody's hands because there is a whole section of people, I believe, that that in, would enjoy that, that relate to that. Um, is Is that also something that you thought about when you were uh, deciding, Hey, I'm going to put these books out there. Absolutely. You know, as a, as a trainer or instructor, I've come to understand that each person learns differently than the people around them. And as a result, I knew that I needed to provide the documentation that I was developing in at least four formats. You know, some people can hear someone describe how to do something and know immediately how to do it just from that description. But some people need to be able to read and ponder it a little bit before they understand. Uh, others can watch someone do it in a video or a demonstration of something and, and be able to understand how to use it. And then the others need to actually put their hands on it and try it in order for it to sink in so that they can understand how, you know, thoroughly how to use something. So everybody has this combination of of learning modes, if you will, that's best for them. You know, I already had the auditory mode covered with the podcast. I had uh, kinesthetic and practice, if you will, through my website and tutorials in there. I gave step-by-step. -step, and I figured I needed the visual uh, for YouTube, and I needed a book, something that somebody could actually read and mark up and study and, you know, follow examples and that sort of thing. So, you know, I haven't done too much with the YouTube part of it yet, uh, but the book was kind of the, you know, fill in that gap for people who learn by reading and studying and doing that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. People need different things to learn according to the way they learn. And a book is one way to do that. And whether that's an ebook on an e-reader or whether that's a printed book on paper, you know, the old analog way of doing things, flipping yeah. through pages, uh, <laughs> it's, it's all out there. It's available now for Ubuntu Mate. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, th I think that's a good thing. And I'm supporting Ubuntu Mate as kind of my pet project, if you will, um, because I, I like it. I think it's the best, it's the best out there for new Linux users. Yep. I think that's an awesome way to contribute, man. Yeah. And Martin's not paying me for this. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into, uh, your podcast. Uh, yeah. it's called going Linux. Um, and from what you said, you started it so you started the podcast, I believe, in 2005, and that's right around the time when you started using Linux, right? Well, I actually started the Going Linux podcast in 2007. I started oh. podcasting in 2005. My first podcast was a Windows tips and tricks kind of podcast. Really? So I was doing the same thing, but for Windows users, right? And then as I moved to Linux, I thought this Windows stuff is overdone. I'm not interested in it anymore. I got to do this for Linux. And that's how in 2007, I started going Linux. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. So at that time, podcasts were not uh, the going rate. Like today, everybody has a podcast. And back yeah. then, it wasn't like this this uh, super popular thing. So what got right. you into podcasting to begin with? Well, in 2005, when I started podcasting, podcasting was a year old, right? And so I was learning how to podcast. I had heard about, um, you know, the daily source code with Adam Curry, and I had subscribed to what few podcasts were out there. And I was very interested in podcasting as as a communication medium, as a training medium uh, in my professional life. And so I learned more about podcasting, learned how to do it, uh, picked a topic that I knew something about helping people to use Windows at the time, and used that as as kind of my way of of learning how to do that. And so I got interested in podcasting just through listening to podcasts, actually through listening to audiobooks at first. And then one of the audiobook authors started distributing his books through podcasts. I thought, what's this podcasting thing? So I 
started subscribing to his podcast. So, you know, every chapter that came out was a new podcast episode. Uh, and then explored podcasting a little bit more and then realized as I moved into Linux that there were very few Linux podcasts out there. And so I seized the opportunity and said, well, I've got to do something um, and I'll, I'll do something for what I know is helping new users to, you know, move to Linux and answer questions for people. And as, as I started giving examples with Ubuntu in the podcast, I found out that uh, it was very popular. I found out that it was very easy to answer people's question using those examples. And so that just reinforced that Ubuntu was, like I said earlier, was the, was the way to go for new Linux users. And uh, uh, podcasting was a great way to get the word out about it because it was becoming more popular. It was very fledgling. Even in 2007, it was it was early days for podcasting, but it was a great way to get um, those who uh, had found out about podcasting to understand and learn about about Linux. And at that point, I had no thoughts of writing a book or anything like that. So this was the way I was going to get the word out. <laughs> so you choose the name Going Linux. Yeah. Um, and a name, you know, seems like, uh, it's not a big deal, but a name is, is your brand mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And it's a pretty important thing. So how'd you go about choosing that name and what were the goals when, like, when you start, Hey, I'm going to do this podcast, were there ultimate goals in that? No, I just picked it out of the air. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I did have some goals. So first of all, the goal was I, I knew that my audience was going to be computer users who were new and struggling to use Linux. So I wanted something that conveyed that in the name, because you're quite right, the name is very important. Um, I wanted it to convey a meaning, something like an action, like using Linux or learning Linux or adopting Linux or something like that. I didn't want it just Linux, you know? Yeah, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, right. And so in searching for combinations of terms, you know, let's not make it like a six word title. So combinations of two or three words that convey some sort of action about understanding Linux, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I looked to see what was available at the time and going Linux was the first one that I came across that was available, uh, that somebody didn't already own it or there wasn't a squatter squatting on that, you know, URL. Right. So going Linux was the one I ended up with and it served me well. And it seems to be, it conveyed the right thing. And those were my goals. Right. And, uh, yes, it has served you well, uh, as of the last count, cause you just released an episode uh, this past week. Yeah. So as of the latest count, you have 386 episodes of the Golden yeah. Linux podcast. That Seems is... Seems like only yesterday. I was dude, that is an amazing <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, what drives your passion to continually produce this all the time? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an easy one. It's the listeners. Um, I'm, I'm driven for some reason to help people. And I found a way to do that in podcasting and writing books and other things, but in podcasting. And it's fun and interesting for me. And I love interacting with the listeners and helping them to learn about Linux. And, you know, we've got listeners that have been around for years, since day one, some of them. Uh, and they have learned more by now than I have to teach. Okay. They, they, <laughs> but they stick around for the podcast for some reason. Uh, and we're glad and happy to have them. And then there are always this influx of new users. New listeners come on board. They learn what they need to learn. They go off and they explore Linux on their own. Some come back. Some have stayed with me forever. And, uh, you know, others are you know, they, they come and go and there's always new Linux users who need a podcast to help them learn how to use it better. Right. Well, every other show you have, uh, you do, you do a listener feedback episode. Yep. Um, and the whole show is based on answering questions, reading emails, mm -hmm. voicemails. This is, this is like a, a great way to get the community involved. 
Um, yeah. Is this the reason for the success of the show? Yeah, I'd say that it is. I, I think it's key to the popularity of the Going Linux podcast. I think it's g- key to podcasts in general to listen to your audience. And we have a perfect way of doing that in taking in questions and ask, answering the questions. I'm continuously amazed that since 2007, every month we have enough listener feedback in one form or another, emails, voicemails, whatever it is, to dedicate an entire episode every month to answering questions and nothing but answering questions and giving advice about, about, about Linux. So thank you, audience. I really appreciate it. And Bill does as well. And my co-hosts over the years have too. And uh, yeah, thank you. Without you, there wouldn't be a going Linux. But that's a testament to you and all of the effort that you've put into it, um, that you have that. like Must be providing some sort of value. Yeah. <laughs> on your site, you have screencast tutorials. Yeah. Um, you, like simple things like changing your password in Ubuntu Mate. Right. Uh, you have your email listed. You have uh, uh, your MeWe page listed. You mm-hmm. have your phone number listed that you can people can leave voice like actual voicemails. Sure. And that is an amazing thing to see in a podcast. There are a lot of podcasts out there. Some of them, you know, do an effort to you know get the community involved. But this is like going that extra mile in getting the community involved. And I believe that is the reason for the success of the podcast. Well, I, I can't disagree. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I, my philosophy is if we're going to help people to adopt Linux, we need to make it easy for them to contact us in a way that, you know, is easiest for them, whether that's by phone call or whether that's sending in an email or whether that's uh, tweeting us on Twitter, whatever it is. Just uh, make it easy for people and they'll ask the questions. Yep. They have the questions. They just need a way to ask them. So all of these episodes that you put out, um, is there maybe a favorite episode or maybe a favorite memory oh, of an episode? <laughs> That's like asking if I have a favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're all my favorites. Uh, you know, okay. Right. I, that's the standard <laughs> answer, right? Um, well, uh, just thinking about it, the, I, can, I can say this, that the two that I've received the largest number of listens... Uh, as judged by the Internet Archive, which isn't always the best way to judge your number of listeners, but it's where we post our, our um, where, where we deposit all our episodes and we link to those from, from the, uh, from the uh, RSS feed. But um, looking at the number of times things have been downloaded from there and estimating that those are listens, if you will, there are two that stand out. Um, episode 127 which is titled KWTV Live uh, and the interview, (laughs) and then episode 125, listener feedback. They're both from, interestingly, from 2011. I don't know what it is about 2011, but that's when our most popular episodes were. Uh, And the first one is an interview of me by uh, Nightwise, a Belgian podcast. Well, I think he's Dutch, but he lives in Belgium. And he does a podcast um, for... He's a um, a professional IT person, a software consultant, and helps companies with what he does. But in his day-to-day life, he's sliding between Windows, Mac, and Linux on a constant basis. And so he talks about how to use computers to get things done. but also using computers, um, well, let me put it this way. His philosophy is one that I've already mentioned, which is computers should uh, be things that do what you want them to do and not the other way around. Right. Uh, and so uh, he and I, you know, uh, he, he listened to my podcast. I listened to his podcast. We eventually, we ended up talking to one another and he interviewed me. Uh, and that that was that episode. So I'm I'm anticipating that your episode here will get a few listens as well. Apparently, people are interested in me for some reason. And uh, the other one was uh, a listener feedback episode. There was nothing really special about that episode. None of the topics kind of stand out as 
you know, earth shattering insights into how Linux works as an ecosystem, right? Nothing like right. that. It's just another listener feedback episode. And so th those are the two that have the most downloads. If that says anything, I don't know, <laughs> but I, I really don't have any favorites. I hear you. I hear you. They're all your favorites. <laughs> yes. Yes. They're all my favorites. Well, not only you uh, are involved in Going Linux, from 2008 to 2014, you were also on a show called Computer America, which mm -hmm. is a radio show that kind of yep. grew into podcast, YouTube type thing. Yep. Um, how'd you get involved with them? Yeah, that was, that was an interesting number of years. Lots of fun in that. Um, they're, they're, they had a segment on Linux before I joined the the show. It was hosted by Marcel Gagné out of Canada, uh, another popular Linux YouTuber and yep. podcast host. Uh, so he was their Linux correspondent for a number of years, and he left the show. Uh, and I don't remember whether it was Marcel or whether it was Craig Crossman, the host, uh, or whether it was Kerry Holtzman, his co-host, who listened to the Going Linux podcast, but Craig called me and invited me to spend, you know, two hours live on the air every month with he and Carrie. And it just took off from there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but it, I found that it took a lot of time. And with my personal life and my career and the podcast and the website, uh, at 2014, it just got to be a little too much time investment required. So I made the choice to to leave the the live radio broadcast uh, environment. And my understanding is Marcel Gagné went back again as their uh, Linux correspondent. And I've kind of stopped listening and lost track, but uh, I understand they're still going on. I don't know whether the show has morphed into something different or not, but uh, I'm hoping they're continuing on with with what they've been doing. I think Craig may have may have retired and his son taken over, but hey, these things happen, right? <laughs> yep. Well, especially when they span so many years. So. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and he'd been on, his, his tagline was something like the longest running uh, radio show on technology or something, you know. Yep. <laughs> uh, longest running syndicated radio show on, on technology. Well, you have a whole career in podcasting, um, mm -hmm. looking back on that, are there some obstacles that you encountered uh, that maybe you can pass on some advice to people who want to follow that same path? Everything was smooth sailing from day one, <laughs> overnight success. Uh, <laughs> I get you every time with that, don't I? Right. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. So there were a few obstacles. Uh, being pretty technologically uh, adept, I'd say um, the technology part of it was pretty straightforward. Getting good quality audio was a challenge at the beginning, and that's a matter of getting good equipment, but also understanding how to do editing well. And I think we've got that down. Every once in a while, we flub it. But hey, everybody makes mistakes from time to time. But we've we've gotten a lot better over the years. Just go back to episode one and listen to that. You'll be <laughs> you'll be amazed at how bad that was. But I think everybody's first episode of podcast was whatever their podcast is is a mess by comparison as they improve over the years. So, advice. Um, for people getting into podcasts, regardless of the subject, whether it's Linux or something else, doesn't matter. Uh, but number one is pick a subject you're interested in and know a little about. That may seem intuitively obvious, but I've listened to one or two episodes of podcasts that, A, I don't know what it's about after listening to it for one or two episodes, or it's pretty obvious that the person doesn't know a lot about. So if it doesn't at least interest you, it's not going to be of interest to your audience. The next piece of advice, and I have like four or five of these, um, is you don't have to be an expert to have a podcast on whatever the subject is. There are plenty of podcasts that are based on people's journeys around learning to do something, 
Uh, and those are some of the most interesting podcasts that I've listened to. Even though I have no interest in learning what they're learning, just following their journey can be interesting, right? It's yep. watching like watching a television show. Um, but um, next piece of advice is don't be scared off by thinking that there are other podcasts on the topic that interests you. Uh, the, the key thing to remember there is none of those people have your perspective on the topic. And so even though it, even though you may decide, okay, I want to start a podcast on Linux, right? When I started, right. there weren't that many, but there were quite a few, some of which have pod faded off into oblivion, but others of which started before I started and are still going. But um, I've been successful and my co-hosts have helped me be successful over the years because we have a unique perspective on it. Our perspective is to help new users to Linux, and that's worked very well. The, the next, and this will be the second last bullet point piece of advice, is speak to your audience and ask them to tell you what they like and what they don't like. And we get that feedback all the time through the format of the show, through the listener feedback. But every once in a while, we take a poll and we ask people their opinions and that sort of thing. And um, the last piece of advice is allow enough time. Podcasting takes a lot of time. Uh, and you've got to be able to do research and write notes and record and edit and publish. And if you're doing just an audio podcast, allow two to three times the length of which you expect the show to be. So if you're doing a half hour show, it's got to be an hour, an hour and a half, maybe even two hours of time to do all that work, whether that's yep. researching and notes. And, um, and I'm assuming you're going to do some sort of editing, even if that's putting a tag at the front and a tag at the back, you're still going to do something. And if you're doing video, Rocco, tell me if this fits with what you say. Uh, you've got to allow three to four times <laughs> the amount of time, uh, unless you're doing something that is just record the video, slap it to air, and you're done. <laughs> you know, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of time. I would say yeah. that that's that's at least three to four times the amount of time yeah. you need. So. Yep. Yeah, that's just that's just from doing those short little tutorials that <laughs> that I yep. do, you know. And, and I guess it all depends too on how uh, particular you are yeah. on making it sound good or not sound good, look good or not look good. So, um, you know, you can put a video out there, and it, you know, it would be fine. But if you're particular in the way you want it, it's going to take a lot of time. Yeah, so. and would you agree with me that? For video podcasting, the audio is more important than the quality of the video. I would say that the audio quality, no matter if you're doing audio, a podcast audio or a video, is equally important regardless mm -hmm. of what it is. Because yeah. there are a lot of people that will, like this podcast, a lot of people listen to it. They don't even watch it. Um, yeah. But also, if the audio quality is bad, it's something that you can't get over. Like yeah. a video quality, you can kind of get over that because you understand, you know, maybe the camera's blurry or a little bit or whatever. But right. audio quality, it's it's very restrictive as far as it's unforgiving. Yeah, yeah. You you can you can overlook the the poor video if the audio is good, but you can't. The, the inverse doesn't apply. You know, nope. if you can't hear it, you have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> 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 Got to be able to hear it. Yeah. All right. So. What are the future goals for Going Linux? Any uh, long-term plans? Um, there's a lot of continue doing what we're doing because we've been pretty successful doing what we're doing without sitting, you know, resting on our laurels. So we want to continue to focus on new Linux users. Uh, we want to concentrate on helping people to get things done using Linux and open source software. Um, we want to make sure that we remember that once you get past the question how do I do this thing on Linux, whatever it is you're trying to do? It's all about the applications rather than the operating system. Because people don't use a computer to use the operating system. They use the operating system to use the applications. That's what helps them to get things done. So we want to do more focus on the applications rather than Linux as an operating system. 
And we want to make sure we continue to listen to our listeners so that we can continue to help them. Because if we don't listen to them, we're not going to be much help. Yep. Well, speaking of applications, uh, you already talked about your workflow um, and how you do things like with Barrier. Uh, mm -hmm. What about software? Is there software that, like, if you make a new install of Ubuntu Mate, get a new computer, yeah. you install Ubuntu Mate, is there a certain software that you install right away that you have to have? Yeah, well, as you can imagine, being a podcaster, there are certain things like Audacity and EasyTag and FileZilla and Pulse Audio Volume Control and those kinds of podcast supportive software that have to go on there. Uh, most Linux distributions, including Ubuntu Mate, come with uh, Firefox as the browser. I have to have Chrome. Uh, I have to have both, actually, because I like to switch back and forth and make sure things that work fine on Chrome will work on other br uh, browsers as well. I include things like OBS and Shotcut and Simple Screen Recorder to do the video. LibreOffice has to be on there, and it is on most Linux distributions by default. But things that I add in the way of utilities are things like Simple Note, note-taking uh, yep. application that allows you to do some markup, uh, Git and Git Kraken, which are to Git-related things that help me to push the updates to the Ubuntu Mate guide, the help system within Ubuntu Mate, and work with that team. Um, other utilities, things like Barrier, of course, Zoom, Skype, Slack, Discord, TeamViewer, all those things have to go on. <laughs> and uh, any scripts that I have written, Bash scripts, I've written a lot of Bash scripts to automate a lot of this stuff, including a Bash script to install all this stuff. As soon as I upgrade to a new version, because yep. I like to install from scratch rather than actually hit the upgrade button. Um, so yeah, those those are the kinds of things that I have to have. Um, there's there's a longer list than that, but that gives you a sample. Yep. Well, what about software that's not currently available for Linux? Is there something that you would say, man, I would love to have that on Linux? You know, for the average user, it really depends on how they use their computer. Um, and for me, uh, I have found, for the most part, that I can find what I need. Um, but for somebody who's who's the average computer user picking the most popular application for a photographer or a YouTuber or a, a music producer or a programmer, if it's not already on Linux or has an equal or better alternative to whatever that most popular application is, that's what should be available, I think. Uh, for me, I can find most of what I need. My personal philosophy is if, if I, I uh, am looking for some software uh, and the first place I'll go is to the Ubuntu Mate repositories to see if they already have something in that category. And then I'll go to the snaps and see if there's something there. And if not, I'll go look at open source software in general and see if it's there. And then if it's not available there, I stop for a minute and think, do I really need this application at all? And if I say, yes, I do, then I go and look to see if there's a download on the software developer site that supports Linux. And if there's not, I take another step and say, how much do I really want this? And then uh, if the answer is I still really want it, then I'll find a way to either um, do it with some other software or uh, download the proprietary version if necessary. Yep. You know, you just mentioned open source, um, proprietary software. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, pushback in the community as far as only proprietary software, only uh, open source software. Right. You know, I mean, you've already mentioned it. Uh, yeah. But are you open to using proprietary software or um, is it something that uh, you don't want to do? Well, I kind of described that in my thought process a minute ago. <laughs> I am pragmatic from the perspective that, you know, if there's no open source uh, software available, I will use proprietary software and I have used proprietary software. But as soon as there's open source software that does what I want it to do in the way that I want it to do that replaces that proprietary software, I'll switch to open source. 
mainly because I am an enthusiast for open source software. I'm not a zealot who's out there, you know, proselytizing the benefits and, you know, the religion of open source. No, I, that's, yeah, uh, I don't do that. Um, that's just not me. But I prefer to use open source software. But if there's no other way to do it than to use proprietary, I will do that. Um, I do that for my work. Uh, right. There's a lot of stuff that we do that requires proprietary software because it's a corporate environment and there's no proprietary software that's acceptable to the corporation either because it's not vetted well enough or because it doesn't have the right set of features. And so I don't put up a stink and insist that we have to use open source software. I just use what they ask me to use and get the job done. So yep. yeah, I'm, I'm more pragmatic that way. Well, let's talk about the uh, Linux conferences. You yeah. um, uh, have been a presenter at the Southern California Linux Expo. What is that expo like as far as compared to other Linux conferences? And what talks have you given there? Yeah, well, I can't say that I've been to any other uh, Linux expos. I've been to other conferences on other topics, but not on Linux specifically. Uh, but what I've heard about Southern California Linux Expo from other people who have uh, attended multiple is that it's larger. It is um, less advertisey, if that's a word. You know, it's it, right. it pushes less the the companies and their their purchase me software and more open source because it's run by the community, right? So it has it has an open source feel to it. But it is bigger than some of the uh, other uh, Linux-focused expos out there. Uh, and they have a wide variety of talks for any, uh, any interest, whether you are a developer or uh, you're a high school student learning about Linux for the first time and you just want to get it installed on the laptop that's six years old that your dad gave you, right? Um, <laughs> you can go there and you can do that and you can attend a class or you can learn about it or you can go into the breakout sessions and uh, there, there's a lot going on and some of it simultaneously and you can't do everything all at once. And there's usually something before the Southern California Linux Expo like a, an Ubuntu meetup or something like that that's going on. Um, so there's a lot going on for that week. And to your question about what have my talks been about, um, I've done two talks there. One is on podcasting uh, using Linux to do podcasting, so a topic of podcasting. And how do you do podcasting using Linux? This was in the early days of podcasting. Uh, and in the early days of me learning to use Linux as well. Uh, so I think it was Ubuntu Intrepid Ibex, I think, is, is the one I was using at the time for that talk. Uh, but, you know, everything that I do for the podcast and for these talks was, was produced, developed, recorded. I'm using Linux and open source software to do that. Uh, the second talk I gave was Linux for Windows users, just kind of the, the, the common theme here. Yeah, I'm moving from Windows. I want to learn more about Linux. And so this was for people who are using Linux, Windows today, interested in moving to Linux. Here are some things that might be of interest to you in the format of a talk at, at, a, at a conference. Uh, both were a lot of fun. I've, I've done a lot of public speaking in a lot of events. Um, everything from training users to use computers and software to these kinds of formal talks at this conference and other conferences. And uh, I enjoyed a lot. Well, um, I would love to attend uh, one of those talks. Are you, do you have any plans on going to any other Linux conferences lately? Or uh, I have wanted to go to SCALE, Southern California Linux Expo, for the past several years. I, I've lost track, but my work schedule and the schedule with everything else have prevented me from going. I have had my finger on the mouse button to buy the ticket several times and something has always come up, but it's so yeah, I don't have any plans 
uh, concrete plans at this point, but if I can get to give another talk, I will. I just have no idea when that will be. And yeah. it'll probably be something for a new Linux user <laughs> to chew on. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of I people do. I know that are going to uh, scale. So, yeah, I would love to attend someday. Yeah, it's it's a great conference. It's, uh, I mean, it's easy for me to attend here on the West Coast. For you to come from the East Coast, it's a little more costly, yep. a little more time consuming. And with these days, the joys of travel, uh, at least you're not traveling internationally to do it. Right. So. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons why I'm not there. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, Larry, what would you say drives your passion for Linux? You know, we do podcasts. You try to help people. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we first started, when you first started, you were looking to customize. I was looking to customize when I first started. Yeah. Um, the community has been such a great outlet for me. And is what I continue to say is the best reason to run Linux. But I agree with that. Where where does your passion for Linux? So what drives me, I think, is uh, for me personally, using Linux is it gives me control over my own destiny and the use of the operating system. I have Linux on four computers sitting around me in this house. Uh, <laughs> I have one that I use day to day. I have one that's more than 10 years old, uh, both running um, the, I can't say the latest version. Well, yeah, it's the latest version right now. In the end of the month, uh, it will be, you know, a, a different story at the end of April. But um, uh, it will get that upgrade as soon as it becomes available. And the 10-year-old is using the last long-term support. Uh, release of Ubuntu Mate and running quite happily doing that. And I continue to be amazed at how much Linux in general gives life back to old computers and lets brand new computers run extremely fast. And so just the fascination with the capabilities and the control that Linux gives me. Um, and the, the second reason is that it allows me to give back to the community. Uh, you, you said community is the most important thing. Uh, I, I agree with that a hundred percent. And, you know, whether that's giving back by way of the podcast or what I write on, on my website or other co contributions to the community in general, volunteering my time for Ubuntu Mate and the various projects that I've done for them. It's, uh, that's what, that's what drives me. I, I enjoy doing it. It's, some would say it's a hobby, but it's a lifestyle, I think. I love it. Yep. <laughs> well, again, you've been in Linux for a long time, so you've had to see maybe some of the most, some of the not so good experiences in the community. Mm -hmm. um, there have been, uh, well, okay, so Linux used to have a bad reputation. It did. Yep. Yep. Uh, for being negative, for being brood, whatever you want to call it. And we've gotten better over the years, but how has your experience been on a whole? Um, overall, although there've been a few trolls along the way, nobody's really treated me badly, me personally badly. I've seen them treat other people badly, but I've never been treated badly. I think it's still out there. Uh, but I, you know, I spend time helping newbies, right? <laughs> and so I get more <laughs> thanks than flames in what I'm doing. And so, yeah, I'm, and I tend to be a little more of an optimist than a pessimist. Uh, so I like to think that people are generally good and I look for the good in people. And if, if there's somebody behaving badly on a forum or a website, I try to soften the blow a little bit and get them talking about the problem instead of the anxiety that they're feeling that's causing them to behave badly, whatever that is. So that's kind of, that's, that's my experience around that. Well, you earlier, you mentioned the, the script that you created for installing programs. Um, hmm. Do you do a lot of coding and scripting? Is there like something you can say, well, you know, this is a, this is one, like one of my, you know, that question, favorite scripts. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they're all my favorites, Rocco. Right. They're all my favorites. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I do, I do a fair amount of tinkering around with with scripting. I don't do uh, a lot, if any, programming in my professional life. Although you know, I've learned a few languages over over the years, starting with Fortran and Basic and those kinds of things, and DOS DOS batch scripting uh, and Linux bash scripting. Um, and today my programming is mainly around tinkering around to automate some things that I find myself doing over and over again. And then again, there are some things that I do over and over again that I just enjoy doing. So I don't bother automating those because <laughs> I enjoy doing them. So most of my scripts are around making myself more productive in, you know, installing the things that I install over and over again, or in producing the podcast or those kinds of things. So. I think the favorite script, I do have a favorite script for what I've written, is one that I found, there's, there's this little program on, um, on uh, the Mac called Caffeine, and it's been brought over to Linux as well. And it's a very simple thing. You click an icon in the tray, um, Windows term, in the uh, taskbar, another Windows term, in the panel, okay, yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can take the, 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 the podcaster out of Windows, but you can't take the Windows out of the podcaster, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you click on the icon and you enable it. And what it does is it just keeps your screen from going asleep, right? Right. It's just a simple program, right? Uh, but what I found was I wanted something that did a little more than that with a one-click thing. Uh, and that was I wanted to be able on my laptop to switch not only between keeping the screen on, but while it's on, it's usually because I've got the laptop plugged in. And so I want the screen at full brightness as well. So I wrote a script to toggle between full bright and don't go to sleep. and go to sleep after a certain period of time and use 50% brightness to preserve right. battery life. And uh, depending on whether I'm on battery or not, I'll click the button and switch between those two. So it's a caffeine, but better. And I have that script uh, in the book, if you want to use it <laughs> for what it is. It's <laughs> very not nice. very complex, but it's pretty, <laughs> pretty straightforward. And uh, I use it every single day. I really do. Nice. Caffeine plus. That's what yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever. All right. So um, there's a lot of people out there, uh, whether they're new or or get just getting into Linux or whatever, that feel that they can't contribute to Linux. Mm. They're not a developer. They're not going to write code. Um, but a guy like you is a perfect example of contributing to Linux in tons of different ways whether it's podcasting or the manuals or the help, um, you have done so much in that area. Uh, and on your uh, LinkedIn page, you say, as a technology advocate, I contribute to Linux open source communities by authoring, publishing books, manuals, guides, and other documentation. Um, and you go on. But uh, what would you say to those people who are searching to find some way that they contribute to Linux? Yeah, so there are a number of ways. I about six different ways, I think. Um, you can create tutorials or write books or, you know, create podcasts or video like I'm doing. You can go to the forums for the distro of your choice and answer questions. That's pretty valuable. Uh, people have questions and often in the forums, they go unanswered for a period of time. And the more people in there answering the questions, the better off it is for everybody. You can go to the forums and ask questions. Oftentimes, the questions that you ask are instructional for other people who are asking for the same thing, because when you go to a forum, you don't, most people, don't blurt out their question and then never look back at the answer. They go to search, is this question already answered? So if you ask a question and it gets answered, you're helping out the community. The next thing I think I could recommend is enable telemetry and send bug reports. You know, maybe that's a little controversial in these days of privacy and, you know, not wanting to share information. But if you're comfortable enabling telemetry, go do that because that's going to help out the developers of whether it's the operating system, the desktop, one of the applications, 
whatever it is, enable telemetry and feed those automatic reports back. It also helps drive up our stats as to how many people are actually using Linux or are reported to use Linux. So I'd like those numbers to show actually what they are rather than, you know, uh, being suppressed by the fact that, you know, this this technical community doesn't like sharing. Uh, And then the bug reports, send those um, whenever you can. And in Ubuntu, they've got this uh, handy little utility that most people don't know about that walks you through a form on the screen for filling out a bug report with, tell us about this, tell us about that. And it's like five or six questions and you're done. And if you just add a terminal or alt F2 to call up the run command, type Ubuntu dash bug, it'll bring up the form and you fill it out and you hit send at the end and you're done. And you've just filled out a bug report. You didn't have to learn anything about filling out bug reports. Okay, and then you can go into the developer area. You can test. You don't have to know anything about development to test to see if something is working. So volunteer your time if you've got it to do testing. And if you are a developer, fix the issues for the things that you use, please. (laughs) There's always something that needs fixing. So those are the ways that people that I see can contribute to the community beyond the things that I do. Yep. Well, all good recommendations. And uh, I think that uh, that's one of the things that new users struggle with because they come to Linux, they see the community, they like it, but they're just, you know, well, I can't really contribute to anywhere. And I think all of those are great. Yeah, and and the Linux community is massive, massive. And regardless of, you know, the petty squabbles that different distributions have had over the years with one another and developers have had. Um, The communities help one another a lot, uh, more than you would think. I see people from the Linux Mint community in the Ubuntu Mate forum and vice versa. And people in the Arch, the, the infamous Arch community are always helping people out regardless of where they are. So I see the same people in multiple communities. It's, it's a great way to contribute, but it's a great way to get your questions answered and, and, and help the community in the, in the process. Yep. So do you believe that Linux is bad at promoting itself or marketing itself? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> in a word. Yes. That's a simple answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's face it, companies won't market something that doesn't make them money. And most Linux distributions are free of charge. And it's up to the community to market desktop Linux. That's that's the only, you know, um, part of Linux, the, the only part of the Linux community that's going to do any of this work because a corporation, regardless of whether they use Linux or they develop Linux, like Canonical, mm-hmm. they're not going to spend money on something that doesn't make them money. Canonical doesn't advertise Ubuntu very much. They do a bit, but they advertise their other services for corporations that will pay them money for those services. That makes sense, right? Yep. And that's one of the reasons that I do what I do. Uh, A lot of what I'm doing is advocating for open source software and Linux. And that's me as a community member marketing Linux beyond the community, you know, but beyond the captive audience that we have. And that's another reason why I chose to help new Linux users, because if they learn about Linux through my advocacy or someone else's advocacy, find the podcast, have their questions answered, and it makes it easier for them, I think that's one of the keys to successful marketing is the follow through as well. Uh, And to be successful, the marketing around desktop Linux, I think, needs to focus less on technical superiority of the operating system over Windows and Mac and more along the lines of focus more on what you can do with it. Take a lesson from the Apple playbook. Look at their ads. All of their ads are around, oh, look what you can do with a Mac, not the operating system, with a Mac, right? Yep. So if we took 
in in marketing as a community, marketing Linux or advocating for Linux, if you don't like the term marketing because that implies getting money for what you're doing, right. advocating for Linux, show off what it can do and describe for people what they can do with Linux that they can't do other places or that they can do better or yep. that they can do that the others don't do or don't do well. You know, I think I've said the same thing a couple of times the same way, but for different ways. But you get the idea. I, yep. I The bottom line is we can't expect the companies to market Linux because it's not something that's going to make the money and it doesn't make sense for them to spend money on something that isn't going to make them money. So as a community, we have to do the marketing. And I don't see a lot of that going on. No, I think we definitely could use uh, the help. I mean, all of us try to, I hate that word, that marketing word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but advocate. Like, advocate. Advocate for Linux. <laughs> yeah, all of us try to advocate for Linux. Uh, but the more people that do, and I don't think you have to even, like, say it. You can just be an example of yes. what Linux does and, you right. know, Hey, I do this. I don't have to tell people I do this, but they see, I do this on Linux and mm -hmm. that will be a better example than any words you can say. Yeah, I think so. And I think that, you know, as, as Linux gains more popularity, it becomes more and more visible and that's part of marketing as well. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, um, one one of the questions I know that you ask everybody that you interview is, if you could change one thing about Linux, what would it be? That is what it is, is its visibility. And I think, though, that it's changing. I think as Microsoft begins to encompass more Linux into its work environment, right, and its operating system, I made a prediction years ago that there will be a Microsoft Linux some version of Windows or an operating system, maybe they don't call it Windows, will be based on Linux, and that's coming to pass, finally. Yeah. It's taken a lot longer than I had hoped, but it's happening. And as Microsoft gives Linux more and more publicity through what it does, and Hollywood, I've seen um, some subtle references to Linux in some of the things that they do. Um, it's becoming more and more visible, and I think that needs to continue. Yep. I, I actually made that prediction, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the same exact yeah. thing, that, that this will be the year. Now, obviously, it didn't come true, but, I mean, we're getting closer and closer that um, Microsoft is going to release a, a, a Linux operating system. <laughs> yeah, we're all waiting for the year of the Microsoft Linux desktop. There you uh. go. Well, there you go. So is the year of the Linux desktop just a meme? Or is there going to be a day where we have the year of the Linux desktop? Uh, I think right now it's, it's, it's definitely a meme. I mean, it's been a meme for years. <laughs> but I think that we will have um, a year of the Linux desktop that comes and goes without a lot of fanfare because it just happens. And whether that's Microsoft becoming uh, a Linux distribution, you know, uh, or if it's Linux distributions taking over the world and populating it with, you know, insidious open source licenses. Uh, however it happens, I think it's going to be very <laughs> subtle and it's just going to happen. And people will wake up one day and say, I've been using a Linux-based computer for three years now. When did that happen? You know? Uh, yep. So there will be the classic meme year of the Linux desktop, but it'll come and go without fanfare, I think. Well, here's that question. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned it earlier. Um, if there's one thing you could change about Linux, is there something specific you think we should be doing uh, in that realm of visibility? Yeah, I, it goes back to marketing, I think, um, or advocacy, right? I think that we as a community need to make a bigger deal about what we're doing and not in the way that I agreed not to say his name. Some um, uh, free software advocates might tarnish the image of open source. Yes. Uh, you don't want to be doing it that way. You don't want to offend people. You don't want to. Um, 
even give the perception of impropriety in what you're doing with Linux. Uh, and so you, you want to do it in a positive way. You want to give Linux more visibility. You want to, well, like I said earlier, you've got to show users what they can do with Linux. And we've got to sell it, another dirty word for some people, but we've got to advocate for it based on, hey, here's what I can do with my computer system and leave it at that. Yep. <laughs> you know? yep. and, and just be more visible, be more positive, show what it can do. And like I said, take a, a lesson from the playbook of Apple. And, and uh, another selling term, I, I mentioned that I was in sales for years, sell the sizzle, not the steak. There you go. <laughs> okay. Well, you told us the reasons why you chose to run Linux mm -hmm. initially. Uh, why is it that you're still choosing to run Linux now? Inertia. I just can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of reasons, but they, they all still apply. I mean, computer users should do what they want, uh, should be able to use computers to do what they want and not the other way around. That's reason number one for me in, in using Linux. And it still holds for me. And I think a lot of users would, would see some benefit in that. Uh, and, um, you know, if a computer is capable of doing something, your operating system shouldn't prevent you from doing it. You should be allowed to make your computer do what you want it to do, even if it breaks the computer. It should warn you that you're going to break the computer. <laughs> but you should be able to do it if you choose to do that. Uh, and today's operating systems just don't let you do that. The popular ones, the Windows and the Macs, uh, and even Chrome, you know, that started off with a Linux base, it's so locked down that it's unrecognizable yeah. in many cases. So... Yeah, those those are the reasons that I started using Linux. Those are the reasons that I continue to use Linux. And those are the reasons why I would think that other people should use Linux. Very nice. Is there anything else you want to share, Larry? Um, I haven't shared enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I just didn't uh, know I'll, if I covered everything. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, all I want to say is... To the people who listen to Rocco's podcasts and videos, and to the people that listen to Bill and me twice a month, thank you uh, for your listening. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you for getting involved with our community on the podcast and with the Linux community in general. And the other thing I'd like to share is if you have a question about Linux, ask. If you have a story of how Linux works for you, share it because other people would like to hear it. And thanks for those who have done that over the years. You've made Going Linux Podcast a successful podcast as a result of doing just that. So thanks. Awesome. How can people get in touch with you, Larry? Uh, I make it really difficult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we talked you about get, all the ways. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, so you can go to goinglinux.com and look. Uh, there are a lot of ways. Um, you can email us at goinglinux at gmail.com. You can go to our website at goinglinux.com and you can go to our MeWe site for uh, a social media kind of environment, forum um, kind of thing, goinglinux.com slash community will take you right there without having to learn, you know, what, what's, what's the alphabetic code for going Linux on me? Right. No, goinglinux.com slash me, uh, slash, uh, community will get you there. And if you want to use old school analog technology and send us a voicemail, uh, on the telephone, uh, you don't have to dial it anymore, but you can still call us at 1-904-468-7889. And although I'm in, in California and my co-host Bill is in New Mexico, that's a Florida phone number. It just uh, happens to be the number that was available at the time. And if you spell it out phonetically, it's, um, let's see, uh, 
it spells something with tux at the end. I even forget what it says <laughs> now, but I picked it because it said uh, something tux. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you, Larry, for joining me. Oh, thanks for inviting me on. I want to say thank you for all of the years of content that you put out, all of the years of helping people, um, all of the ways that you make yourself available to let people get in touch with you because that is that goes beyond uh, what most people do. So I really appreciate that. Well, thanks for that. All right, that's going to wrap it up. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. Until next time, long live Linux. <laughs>